Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another class. Uh, so shall we just begin with a word of prayer? And then uh, we'll begin with our class. Could one of us please lead us in prayer? Any one of us, please lead us in a time of prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, God, we give you glory, give you praises, O Lord, Father, for the precious day, precious time, O Lord, Father, to come together to listen from your word, O Lord, Father, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, Father. This time, O Lord, Father, as we get to know, Lord, Father, Lord Jesus, about the history of, Lord, Father, Lord Jesus, the martyrs of, O Lord, Father, Lord Jesus, in Christianity, O Lord, Father. Thank you, Lord, Father, Lord Jesus, the passion and compassion the people have showcased, O Lord, Father, over the period of time, O oh, Lord Father, they build the foundation, O oh, Lord Father, on which we can stand today, O oh, Lord Father, Lord. We give you glory for all of that, O oh, Lord Father. And as we learn more of it, O oh, Lord Father, Lord Jesus, open our heart and mind to receive it, O oh, Lord Father, Lord Jesus. I invite you, O oh, Lord Father, Lord Jesus, let the same passion, O oh, Lord Father, be generated within us, O oh, Lord Father. Father, we commit pastor into your hand, O oh, Lord Father. Speak through him, O oh, Lord Father, Lord Jesus. Bless him with the wisdom, knowledge, understanding, O oh, Lord Father, that all that he he imparts, O oh Lord, Father, Lord Jesus. It's by the spirit of power of this Holy Spirit, O oh Lord. We give you glory and praises, O oh Lord, Father. Thank you, Father, Lord Jesus, for you are gracious unto us. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Anita. Okay. Uh, so let's continue from where we picked up yesterday. Uh, yesterday, we looked at how God, uh, you know, raised up reformers within the church. Now, uh, remember the background that we shared, the backdrop was, you know, the Roman Catholic Church is taking prominence, is taking power. Uh, there was immorality, there was sin, uh, there was idol worship, wrong kinds of teaching, uh, uh, you know, relic worship, uh, praying to uh, saints and all these things had come up within the church. The reading of the word, the ministry of the word, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit, all uh, the genuine move of God had been suppressed. Right? And we saw that the Roman Catholic Church was, uh, you know, against people uh, from, you know, reading the word or uh, starting, uh, uh, you know, new churches. They were against all of this. And so, that did not cause an end uh, to the church. Right? We saw yesterday that God raised up such wonderful leaders, John Wycliffe, John Huss, uh, you know, uh, uh, Savonrola, uh, all of these people, Ulrich Zwigli, who went on to Switzerland and did a wonderful ministry, Martin Luther, who gave his 95 thesis uh, about you know the the grace of God and we're justified by grace and not through any works and uh, uh, and so we saw all these wonderful things uh, wonderful people uh, who are willing to give their lives for the sake of the gospel another interesting thing that we also looked at was you know God raised up leaders who were highly intellectual right uh so it, it should encourage us to pursue uh, you know a greater a level of knowledge a greater level of understanding yes you know we always say that no god chooses the unqualified and makes them qualified and all that that's good yes he does but that does not mean that you know we stay unqualified right? uh he expects us and when we look at uh, example william tyndale was was uh, 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 you know, he was so brilliant in his studies, uh, and they all had comfortable lives, right? uh, living in different countries of the world, and uh, they didn't have to take up this. They didn't have to, uh, you know, have the burden for the church and write and then put their lives on the line. They could have done anything else and been successful in that because they were very well off. Uh, but we see that the Lord used them. And uh, it's so wonderful that they were willing to give their lives for the sake of the gospel. And what William Tyndale did, he translated the entire Bible into English from the original Hebrew to uh, the Greek. Uh, uh, sorry, from the original Hebrew to English and the original Greek to English. So um, 
and one of his quotes that we looked at yesterday he said that i will make sure that even the plowmen in the fields will have their own bible um, to read from and study from and so god was still moving the Roman Catholic Church, the the Romans, together, all of them were trying to suppress the work, uh, but God was raising up these leaders. Let's continue on, on page 37. Uh, as these things are happening, uh, if you picture it in your mind's eye, you can see that the enemy is working, trying to suppress the work of God, but here we're also seeing that God is working even more powerfully. So it's like the the Roman Catholic Church doesn't doesn't know what to do, right? What what can they do? They're saying, okay, uh, we'll kill every we'll kill anyone who goes against the Roman Catholic Church. But these people are unafraid. Okay, do what you have to do. We will do what God is telling us to do. So uh, it looked like the Roman Catholic Church was in power, but they were not, uh, right? Uh, because these people were willing to do. Uh, whatever it takes to make sure the gospel reaches out to many people. And so this is where the start of Protestants came into being. A Protestant is nothing but somebody who protested the work of the Roman Catholic Church, right? Uh, they protested against, you know, uh, all these kinds of doctrines and teachings within the uh, uh, Catholic Church that was happening at that time. So let's continue to look at the lives of few of the leaders, uh, reformers who, uh, you know, began to again continue to do greater works uh, within the church, even though the uh, you know the Roman Catholic Church was in power. So let's look at uh, John Calvin. I'm sure many of us may have heard of John Calvin. Now he was a devout Catholic, right? A young man, extremely brilliant. Uh, he studied in the University of Orleans, and uh, he 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 was very you know he was very uh, uh, attached, or he loved the teachings of Martin Luther. So he he was able to study his books, Martin Luther's books, and he came to a conclusion that uh, you know this is the truth. We are justified by faith and all of this, and so there was a change within him. So he began to, you know, uh, become a evangelist. He went to different places, evangelizing, uh, sharing the gospel, and uh, uh, and for many years he went about doing that. And uh, for most of his life, he spent writing uh, material. So he wrote plenty of new materials, and uh, uh, he wrote about Christian history. So. Uh, this is early uh, 1500. So he wrote about reformers prior to him uh, uh, and, and the work that they did. And so uh, he was able to impact uh, the church in many ways. Uh, he wrote extensively. Uh, he made pamphlets. He made um, commentaries on the scriptures, especially in the New Testament. And uh, uh, at the age of 27, he was able to you know come up with a... Uh, you know, a systematic way of studying the gospel, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, earlier on in our Bible college, we had a subject called systematic theology uh, many years back, uh, uh, but we don't have that now. Uh, so it was basically the systematic way of studying the Bible. And John Calvin was the one who came up with this. And uh, uh, he carried many missionaries he trained many people many missionaries to go into different parts of the world and uh, and through him uh, the city of geneva was transformed right now john calvin is known for his uh, not sure if we may have read about him but he is known for his uh, talks on predestination in christ right uh, so even if we uh, read about John Calvin's books, he emphasizes the predestination. And also Paul writes about it in Ephesians chapter 5, 1 verse 5. He says, we are predestined in Christ. Romans 8, uh, again, he writes mm -hmm. and he says, you know, uh, we are predestined uh, through, the, uh, through the Holy Spirit. And so what he focused on was, uh, John Calvin, what he focused on was, if we believe in jesus if we are accepted in him 
we are predestined uh, to receive the blessings that come along uh, with being a child of God. And so that was his focus, right? Uh, so he wanted to make sure that the believers know that, you know, we don't have to, once we are in Christ, we don't have to come to his presence by any works. We don't have to try and please God uh, because we're already predestined in him. God has ordained that we would be blessed when we are in his kingdom, when we are uh, you know, partakers of his kingdom. So, um, so he was able to do a wonderful work as well. Again, John Calvin, his ministry was short lived. It was only three years of evangelism. But as I said, a lot of his work was writing right? commentaries and uh, his books went all across through, through different churches and it was a blessing to uh, him, uh, to the churches as well. But uh, he died of old age. He was not martyred. Uh, uh, but he died of uh, not old age. He died of a sickness that, uh, uh, and so he he lost his life very early. But the impact he made was really great. And uh, following on, John Knox, uh, uh, another wonderful wonderful man, a very bold preacher, uh, uh, and God chooses him to uh, reform Scotland. Right now. Uh, here's the picture again. Let me draw a picture or let me paint a picture for each of us. Um, you got the center, which is Rome, right? And then you got churches all across the world, right? like what we saw in um, the second and third century church. So everywhere there is church, there are churches. But there are also Roman influences in all these places. Right? Because the Pope is the leader of the church. So uh, when I'm talking about the church, I'm saying the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, so there was Roman influences everywhere. So in every part of the world, whether it is Africa, whether it is uh, you know England, whether it's America, uh, whether it's Europe, wherever Asia, there was Roman influence. So it was not like, okay, you go to this country, it's going to be easy, uh, you know, you can do whatever you want. No. Uh, they, they would, you know, the Roman Catholic Church would uh, make sure that they will try and, you know, we, we studied about it. You know, they would capture them and try to get rid of those who are trying to do any good work within the church. So here, God chooses John Knox for Scotland. Now, John Knox is known for his bold praying. Right? Uh, he was a very courageous man. Uh, one of the prayers that he made was, Lord, give me Scotland. Or else I will die. Like, give me Scotland. Uh, it was a time when Scotland was completely in a mess, in the sense there was the spiritual morality was down. Churches were following a religious pattern. Uh, uh, you know there was immorality in the church and outside the church, uh, and so John Knox had a burden, and he said, "Lord, give me Scotland, lest I die," and. Uh, of course, he was uh, uh, a Scottish clergyman, uh, and he was a theologian. He he began to read, he began to write, a lot of effort in studying the Gospels. And what he did was John Knox would uh, begin prayer movements, uh, small prayer movements, few people, and they would gather together and they would pray. They would spend time praying for days and days and days for hours together. And uh, finally, uh, you know, some kind of revival happened. Thousands of people started coming into the church. Now, when I say thousands of people, uh, it could be, you know, people from the Roman Catholic Church understanding, okay, this is what it is. This is the true gospel. I need to go here. I need to understand. And it could be people from other faiths as well. Uh, coming into the church, but uh, together thousands of people began to come into the church, and uh, you know it is said that the Queen of Scotland says uh, said that I don't fear the uh, armies of Europe, but I fear John Calvin when he kneels down to pray. So that was the effect. Sorry, John Knox when he kneels down to pray. So John Knox was able to reform Scotland, right? Just as something was dying, God raised up somebody. 
uh, and you know brought restoration there. Uh, then we see in France, so now we saw in Scotland, now in France, uh, reformation, that is this whole thing of, you know, you don't have to, uh, you should reform from the Catholic uh, church and be true to what the word of God says. So this reformation began to make inroads into France, right? Now, the idea of reformation in France was very good. People accepted it, but even though people accepted it, there was intense persecution, right? Uh, Roman Catholicism, you know, they, they suppress the work of God. They suppress these people. And, and uh, uh, what happened was uh, they, uh, the, the French Protestants were even more, you know, they took one step ahead. In a sense, they said that God is everywhere in the scripture. The Holy Spirit has given us gifts to all of us. And so there is gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's, we can speak in tongues. There's working of miracles. Uh, you know, there is uh, visions. There's prophetic utterance. There's supernatural phenomena. All these things should be, uh, you know, uh, present in the church. And uh, there should be the power of the Holy Spirit within the church. Now, after saying all of this, uh, you know, I can, I can just picture the, you know, the Roman Catholic Church says we need to get rid of this whole thing immediately, because the they they've taken it one step ahead. Not only teaching of the Word of God, but here now the gifts of the Holy Spirit, additional things happening, and so uh, through this, France was impacted uh, very powerfully uh, because of you know the gifts of the holy spirit there were signs miracles and wonders it is said that um, something similar to the first century church happened in france if we uh, study of the early 1500s uh, it is said that you know people were uh, you know coming out of their of out of hospitals sick people would come out of hospitals and stand outside and wait for these preachers to come and pray over them Right? Because these preachers weren't allowed inside the hospital, so they would somehow try and get the uh, you know patients out, and then they would pray, and many people were healed. So such was the uh, move of God in France, and and so a lot of people uh, began to call these you know uh, French pastors and leaders and these reformers as French prophets uh, given by God. So again, we see that God is continuing to do a work there. Right. Uh, from there, we go into John Fox. Uh, now, John Fox was in, uh, from Boston in England. And just before the Reformation began, uh, you know, it was during the time when Martin Luther had posted his 95 thesis in Germany. And John Fox, what he did was, uh, he's known for his book, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. So uh, he was able to write about those who died in the, you know, in the in the fourth century, fifth, fourth century church during the Dark Ages, during the Reformation, those who were martyred for the sake of the gospel. Uh, so he wrote this book, Fox's uh, Book of Martyrs, and uh, it's a classic. It's it's even available now. Um, now I remember when I was in Bible College uh, many years back, uh, uh, getting my hands on this. Uh, book Fox's John Fox's book of martyrs and uh, it really stirs you up because of because what we are doing now is just an overview but in his book he writes about you know the challenges that these missionaries and uh, reformers faced and how they were able to do a work and how they that death did not deter them one bit they were not afraid of it at all and it was really encouraging to read that book. Uh, uh, and, and so he wrote this book. Fox believed that Christian history uh, has to be continued on from the Old Testament as well and had to be documented so that people know, uh, like even the very fact that we are studying church history uh, now, so many years later, uh, you know, uh, because it's important that we as ordinary Christians or we need to know 
the unfolding of how God's plan is and uh, how God, God uses certain principles in building up his kingdom. So that was John Fox's ministry of writing about uh, history and, on, and the martyrs of the old. Uh, now, in, after a couple of years, something very important happened. Right, uh, King James came into power. Now, this King James was uh, what he decided was. He said, "Okay, why is all this happening? Why is this so much of bloodshed? Why is there so much of uh, you know disagreements and arguments and wars between each other? Let us resolve this. The whole issue is the Bible." And you know, within you Christians itself, there's so much of uh, war. Why all this? So, uh, King James, being a you know a Roman uh, 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 in, uh, influenced by the Roman uh, people, King James, he said, "Okay, let's make an end to this." And how long are we going to, you know, hear the Catholic Roman Catholic Church is saying, you know? We are in power. The Pope is the leader. Here, the other side, there are some people coming up, writing the Bible and doing some great works of God. And then these people are killing them. And it's it's all looking so bad. So let's try and resolve this matter. So King James, he summoned a meeting. He said, OK, representatives from the Roman Catholic Church and all the other groups, right? Whatever groups, Anabaptist or Anglican or uh, Protestant or whatever, Methodist, whoever is there, uh, everyone, representatives, come and we will solve this problem of religious intolerance. And so what he did was uh, he, he got everyone together and a person named John Reynolds uh, uh, was kept uh, in charge to of the you know, to preside over the meeting and long story short uh, what they decided was okay we will write what is important in the bible right we will translate it no commentaries no additional notes what is important right so what they did was they chose five translations tyndale uh, matthew coverdale great uh, Bible and the Geneva Bible. So these were five translations. So we will take these five translations and we will compile it together, taking only what is important, no extra notes, no additional points, no commentaries, nothing. Just these five versions of the Bible. And we'll have a group of about, I uh, uh, forget how, how, how many people, but uh, I think it's about 40 people. Uh, somewhere around 40 people. And so everyone will be assigned certain books and they will go ahead and translate these books. So they came up with this whole idea. And so uh, this work continued for two years and nine months. Now, after this, they came back together and they said, OK, let's look at it. Uh, everyone were happy. Uh, everyone said, OK, this looks good. But this should be made available for everyone, right? Uh, like even every Christian should be able to get this Bible. So King James said, okay, what we'll do is we will replace all the Bibles that have gone out, right? All the translations. And we will make this the King James Bible, named it after himself, even mm -hmm. though he didn't know anything about it. King James Bible will be replaced by any other Bible that's there around. So now, this is a big moment in church history. The King James Bible is printed and replaced in the main churches. And also later on, he, he said that we will also make these Bibles available for everyone. Whoever is a Christian, whoever wants to buy these Bibles can buy it and study it. Now, this was wonderful. Right, because now the people, the lay Christians, could freely go and get a copy of their Bible. So they didn't have to be afraid whose version do I buy? Or should I buy this version? Should I buy that version? No, they can just buy the King James authorized version. And, uh, and that's how the King James version came into being. Of course, 
the one where we read now is has many additions gone through many uh, changes many uh, word translations uh, and uh, uh, and it's interesting you remember the prayer of uh, william tyndale in you know we studied about it the great man who translated the bible from english to sorry from hebrew to english and greek to english uh, he said that you know i will make sure that every the even the plowman will have a bible uh, and he was martyred for that few years later about a 80 100 to 100 years later the bible is made available for each and every one where even the plowmen were able to go and purchase a bible and use it for their personal needs so you know and the interesting thing is uh, they also now later on as the translations took place they also considered william tyndale's version and they referred to that also uh, uh, to make improvements to the king james version so uh, the king james version would be the version the standard english bible for the next 350 odd years uh, and as i said there were small changes made but then even those changes were not like made just random person chosen no uh, it was a whole committee which came together they saw it they read it they, whatever changes were made only if it was approved uh, it would go on for printing so so this was a a, a great year uh, for the christians uh, uh, now some of us may wonder at least i wondered so what about the roman catholic church did they go against this whole thing of getting the king james version authorized uh, they had no choice right? because the king is saying king james was in control he was in charge uh, i'm sure they would have thought okay why are we doing this uh, it's it's the pope who's in control they, if nobody should get the but i'm sure they would have you know tried and uh, you know uh, gone against this idea uh, but You, you know you can't stop the work of god if god decides something uh, you know as i was reading this i was reminded of uh, you know in the old testament uh, god chooses uh, a heathen king to uh, you know to rebuild uh, the temples uh, the temple of the old testament uh, you know so god here chooses a king who has no idea probably what's in the bible he, he just wanted peace in his in the place that he's living he just wanted you know uh, things to just get back to normal probably and so he said okay let's come up with this but it's wonderful that this happened uh, so for the next about 350 odd years uh, people had their own bibles they could have had bible studies at home uh, the churches began to flourish uh, Uh, many groups were formed of course there was anglican there was methodist there was protestants the quakers different uh, kinds of groups were there uh, now there were i would say there were you know challenges with these groups each of them had different thoughts and ideas uh, but the main point was everyone had a bible so they could go back to the bible read and you know uh, Uh, see if they are in line with god's word now if we get into deeper church history you know uh, it's uh, it is during this time that new kinds of thoughts new kinds of revelations came up with you know, people came up with right uh, where people said you know uh, they were the incarnate jesus some people came up saying that you know uh, i was the incarnate of uh, there was there were few women uh, Uh, during those uh, early 1700s who, who claimed to be uh, the incarnate of mary and so all these ideologies and wrong teachings did come up uh, but what was uh, you know a safe thing was people had the word of god so of course not all of them went to the word and you know uh, looked into the word and made sure that things were right but some of them were uh, just followed blindly but the word of god was available for all of them right so from here on the doesn't mean that now the bible is out so everyone are fine everyone you know can just follow and no so god continues to raise up leaders god continues uh, you know when we study this it reminds us of uh, 
the Old Testament, right? Uh, God continually raises up prophets. Uh, so there were phases. There were good phases, and then there were bad phases. Right? And then there were good phases. There were bad phases. Uh, uh, so even when we read through all through the Old Testament, you got these phases of certain kings where things went well, and then uh, you know certain kings where things were just very bad. Uh, and so the same way in church history, this was a good phase, right? 350 years, good phase. So what happens after this? A person named George Fox, uh, uh, and uh, he was a founder of a, a, a group called the Quakers in England. Now, John Fox was, uh, from childhood, he was, he, he had this desire to study more of God's word. He would uh, spend a lot of time uh, personally praying, and uh, he wanted to experience God. Right? He he didn't want it to just be a form of religion, and so he what he did was he he wanted to experience the manifestation of God's power, like the Holy Spirit working in him, and. What he did was he he began to write this book called the Book of Miracles, where he he wrote about the 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 you know the accounts of miracles, healings, and uh, charismatic gifts and uh, persecutions and all these things that happened. And as he began to write this, many of them took to this writing and said, yes, we need the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It's, uh, now that we have the word of God, we need to uh, ask God to manifest his spirit in, uh, among us. So what he did was he would start meetings, prayer meetings and Bible studies. And it is said that in his Bible studies, people began to receive healing. Uh, people began to experience visions and dreams and uh, pro prophetic utterances and uh, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit began to manifest and uh, uh, this generation came to be known as uh, you know uh, a generation of the charismatic phenomena right the 1600s uh, began to be known as the charismatic uh, movement and this Quakers movement began to spread like wildfire, right? So everyone wanted uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, maybe for good reasons or for bad reasons, but uh, 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 so the, it started spreading. Everyone wanted to be part of this. Everyone wanted to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues and see miracles and all of these things. And so what he did, John Fox, was he raised up 56 uh, traveling preachers and he said, all of you go um, and whatever we have studied, whatever we are doing here, go preach it in different uh, uh, parts of the world. And so within uh, a couple of years, uh, there were about 60,000 people pledging allegiance to the Quakers, right? Now, they did not go against the word of God. They did not teach any wrong doctrine, but their emphasis was more on gifts and uh, prophecy and word of knowledge and healings and all of it, which is good. Uh, nothing wrong about it. Uh, uh, but uh, what happened was the teaching of the word slowly declined. And we will not go into what happened to the Quakers later on, but uh, there was a move of God from uh, from England. The move uh, of the Quakers went into America. It also went into Europe, and uh, thousands of people uh, began to, uh, you know, go go through this whole charismatic phenomena. So it is here that charismatic Christians gave birth, but they didn't know it was charismatic. Okay. The word was not something that they knew earlier on. Uh, just for our study, uh, calling it, uh, the, they were the charismatic uh, Christians. And so from here on comes the 1700s. Now the 1700s, we would say, is the most powerful times uh, in church history, the most powerful times, because God raised up s such wonderful, wonderful missionaries who impacted the world. And, you know, even now their names are written 
uh, in church history, they are written in bold because they were great, great men of God. Uh, and these were all, you know, normal, simple people who God used. And so let's look at some of them. The early 1700s saw the first great awakening in North America. Now, when we use the word great awakening, you will we will see the first and the second and the third great awakening too. Simply means that an awakening of the church, an awakening of something that is dead, uh, like how Reformation, uh, an awakening of something that is already uh, there, but it's sleeping. Uh, so God used two great men in the great awakening in North America. So during the 1700s, there was a moral decline. There was a spiritual decline. Uh, there was a series of wars that were happening uh, all across the world. Shortage of churches, no ministers, no people coming into churches. Many existing churches itself uh, were, in, the, were the institutionalized church. They had no power. Uh, and there was nothing happening. It was completely like a dry, dead situation. Uh, one of the main reasons was because of war. Uh, there were constant wars that were happening during that time. And, uh, uh, and so people were seeing death. Right? People were seeing uh, lives being killed. They were seeing war in their own eyes. Uh, you know? and, and so it probably demoralized them. So what is the point of you know, going to church or what is the point of praying? And when we're seeing death in our own eyes, you know, people dying, children, children dying, innocent lives. And so the whole thing in North America, uh, the whole fervor of, of God and the move of the Holy Spirit was dampened because of this war. Now, God raised up two wonderful men. First one is Jonathan Edwards. Now, Jonathan Edwards was the pastor of a church in Northampton, just a few people in his church. But he did something. He began to pray. He said, God, we need a move in this in, in North America. We need a spiritual awakening in North America. So what he did was he was in uh, Northampton in uh, North America, Massachusetts. And what he did was he began to pray. And he formed a team and he said they would all sit down and pray for an awakening, right? Uh, the intense prayers, day and night. There were times when those prayers would go on continually for days. Uh, and eventually, an awakening poured out, right? From there, suddenly, people started to experience the move of the Holy Spirit suddenly people started coming to church right and then in a year or so thousands of people started coming to the church in northampton in jonathan edwards church right he began to preach on repentance he began to preach on heaven and hell and uh, combined it with the grace and the mercy of god and people would flock into the church if we read about uh, this great awakening, you know, it is said that in uh, Jonathan Edwards church, there were only about uh, 200 odd people who could fit in the church. Thousands of people would come. And so he had a difficulty and, uh, uh, you know, he, he began to look out for places. They had many services. Uh, people would leave their work, right? So for example, people were working, they would stop working and, and they would go, hey, why? Jonathan Edwards has come to preach. Right? And so there was this intense desire of knowing God's word. Then he, towards the end of his ministry, he wrote this wonderful and the most uh, famous sermon. Uh, it, it, the sermon outline is available on Google. You can read it. It's called The Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, and this was the one sermon where it is said that hundreds of people accepted Jesus because of that sermon. Now, uh, you know, history says that Jonathan Edwards is a very, you know, he looked as a, a very ugly looking man, right? He had big boils on his face. He had big boy. He had a big nose with boils on his nose, uh, you know, short and stout. And his preaching style was 
you know, said that it was very boring because what he would do was he would write his sermons down and he would come in front of the congregation and basically read that sermon. Right now, before that, we see that, you know, people like William Tyndale, uh, John Calvin and all these people, John Wycliffe, John House, they were so, you know, uh, uh, Filled with the, I wouldn't say filled with the Holy Spirit. The, the way they preached was so much of, you know, empowerment, and uh, they were passionate about their preaching. But Jonathan Edwards was not so. He would just, you know, read his whole, entire message. So he, uh, he, he used to read this. Uh, he read the message, "Sinners in the hands of an angry God." It said that people sitting in the congregation felt that hell was opening, and and they were running away from that place and they were running to the uh you know towards the altar to give their lives to christ he was just reading the sermon right so it was not about how well he preached or how uh, you know what are the examples he used uh, but it is about the holy spirit that worked inside him and jonathan edwards did a wonderful, wonderful ministry in North America. Thousands, thousands of people. The North, uh, the Great Awakening in North America saw more than thirty to forty thousand people gathered in churches. What was dead? No churches, no ministries. Now North America is flourishing with forty, fifty, uh, sixty thousand believers. When I say now, is when the time Jonathan Edwards came. So, what he did, there was an awakening of the church. Right. Uh, so I was really encouraged with this man because Jonathan Edwards, you know, he did not depend on eloquence of speech. He did not feel that, OK, I need to, uh, of course, eloquence. We need to, you know, we as pastors and those who are serving here, uh, we need to prepare our sermons. We need to do well, uh, practically, uh, you know, make the right sentence construction, preach with the intensity, all of that. But that's not priority. Right. If so, some of us may feel that, OK, I, I, I can't preach like this person or I can't preach like that person, the way they give examples, the way they, uh, you know, uh, so emphatic in the way they give their message. It's not about the physical way of giving out the message. It is the power of God that is at work that will change lives. Right. Uh, so never feel that I cannot do that. Right? Uh, none of us should feel that, OK, I'm not like them. God has used you in your own special way right? like Jonathan Edwards he there was nothing good to look at him you know they, it is said that uh, you know he would put his candle near the altar during that time and he would because he his eyesight was poor the lights in that uh, in the church were not bright enough for him to read his sermon so he put his candle and he would go right his face would go right into his notes he wouldn't even look up and there were times that he would look up and he would see that everyone out on the ground crying and weeping and mourning. But he would just continue to read his sermon. How is that? That's the power of God. Right? So I want to encourage each of us. Let, let us not, uh, you know, in ministry, go after the, the whole thing of, you know, uh, being stylish in our preaching or, uh, you know, people should appreciate. It's not about people. It's not about the way... Uh, we preach, but it is about the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jonathan Edwards spent hours and days in prayer. That's why when he went on the pulpit, even though he read a sermon, people were falling on their knees, crying and weeping. Uh, and so that should be our desire. Another man that God used was George Whitfield. Now, he was also... Uh, wonderful man uh, he was a friend of the wesley's john and charles wesley's he was a gifted preacher and a communicator unlike jonathan edwards he was uh, he was not you know he was not somebody who was denominationally prejudiced which means he didn't say okay i'm from this methodist or quakers or i'm an anglican uh, nothing he even though he was an anglican uh, he did not uh, look at denominations now he traveled extensively across america uh, everywhere he went shopkeepers farmers people who worked again closed their shops they shut down business and they went to the hall why 
George Whitfield has come. George Whitfield was also history. He says that he was a short, fat man, uh, very unpleasant in his looks, uh, you know, uh, and very cut off in his speech. Uh, but people would stop their work. I this this man has come, uh, and he's preaching there. So whether they were Christians or people from other faiths, they would go. And Whitfield preached to thousands, 30,000 people at one place, 40,000, 50,000 people. There was this one time that, uh, uh, you know, this is, this happened in church history where George Whitfield, Whitfield was supposed to go to a place and preach and the auditorium was a 30,000 seater. And, uh, and they thought that, okay, uh, you know, they, they should be able to get about 20 to 25,000 people who should come for the, you know, the meeting. Uh, that town had had only about 70,000 people uh, uh, who resided in that town. So they said, okay, maybe 25,000 people should come. But what happened was when the, when the word went out, George Woodfield is preaching, 50,000 people came. The entire city, the town was empty, right? Uh, the town itself was empty. Where's everyone gone? Everyone has shut down business. Why? George Woodfield has come. And 50,000 people, yes, as Tarun has mentioned, no microphones. Right? Now we've got all the microphones and 50,000 people can hear, no microphones. So what they would do is they would rush into that place because they want to go in front, they want to hear. And and here's the amazing thing. Uh, I, I also wonder, uh, you know, maybe some of them couldn't even hear what he was saying, but... Uh, but the move of the Holy Spirit was there. People were convicted. And uh, there was this one time when, uh, you know, uh, there were so, there was a stampede kind of place and few of them lost their lives. And it was then when George Woodfield said, we need to be more organized. We need to, uh, we thank God for what he is doing, but we need to be more organized. So then they got in structure. Okay, let's make a maximum let's do some kind of a, a thing where you know they have to uh, the first 20,000 or the first 30,000 people will only be allowed and they would have meetings in the morning and the afternoon and in the evening so people would choose and so that way there would be no uh, you know difficulties George would feel preach more than 3,000 sermons all all across America 3,000 sermons and more touching many lives. Again, North America was awakened by the move of God. So we see that God used these two simple men. One, both of them not very, uh, you know, uh, uh, good in their looks or the way they were, but both simple men, powerful in the Holy Spirit. And then what happens is in Germany, uh, we see that God uses this man named Count Zinzendorf. Uh, now, he was a reformer, just like John Huss. And Germany began to experience the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? Uh, they, Of course, what they did is they replicated what happened in North America where of, you know, uh, praying, spending time in prayer, personal prayer and all of it. And this continued on. Uh, Prayer, this prayer movement continued on for 100 years. And uh, this birthed many missions, many missionaries, many uh, pastors, many churches were formed in Germany. So uh, there was this revival in Germany as well. Uh, okay, uh, let's quickly do the Methodist revival, just a overview, and then we will close. Now, the Methodist revival happened in England. Right. Uh, we know John Wesley and his brother Charles Wesley. Uh, basically, how it was founded was both were in college and uh, both were very, you know, they had a very deep desire for the word of God and to preach the word. And so, uh, you know, it says that, you know, John would tell his brother Charles, OK, we are we have a break now. So uh, in the universities when they both were studying, so they, they would say, OK, you play a song. Charles will play a song and John will come up and preach. And so they will do that. It started off as a small Bible study group in the, in the college, in the universities. Few people would come. They would, then they started uh, 
from there it went outside the campus from six in the evening to nine uh, so john charles wesley would uh, you know lead the worship john wesley would come and preach and so this happened every wednesday and friday and once a week they would have communion uh, but all of this uh, was happening it was growing but john wesley was not satisfied right so he said okay uh, i want to go to different places and minister he went to another place in uh, in georgia he went there nobody accepted what he was preaching it was a failed missionary journey and uh, and and then after that uh, he returned to england and he found an inner assurance and uh, uh, during a small prayer in a church he accepted jesus again as his personal savior he he calls it his second experience and uh, and then we know that john wesley did a wonderful ministry preaching more than 50000 sermons and traveling more than 250000 miles on horseback uh, finally uh, doing so much to the methodist church starting the methodist movement the reason they were called methodist because john wesley was very very methodical in the way he conducted his services so so uh, we we'll, we'll pick up from next week uh, uh, is it okay is everyone okay with this uh, is it too much information i know we've been doing so many people um, is it okay is everyone okay with this are you able to you know take things okay great okay shall we just it's very inspiring it's wonderful okay. these are inspiring uh, it's wonderful real happenings in the history me. Uh, Pastor, me when you were speaking, I was looking at such men like someone just reading, and people are attached. I am seeing the move that the way the Lord uses men in His own way. He uses Peter in another way. Now He uses that one in another format. So He never lacks methods. Thank you so much. We are being Praise fed. God. Praise God. Praise God, Charles. All right, so uh, I think we have passed our time. Uh, can any one of us please close in prayer? Anyone? Holy Father, we thank you, Lord, for bringing before this what happened in the past in the church history and missions. Lord, how wonderfully you worked in the past, as you worked in the heart of the heathen king, desired us to build the temple. In Jerusalem, Lord, you worked in the heart of King James to bring about the Bible and make it available to every person who wants to read the word. Lord, through this, you brought about a great spiritual revival. Your temple was built in the heart of each and every person. Lord, we thank you for what you have done in the past. Thank you for the inspiring ministries which I heard about Jonathan Edwards. Whitefield and even John Wesley, Lord, these true incidents that happened in the past inspires us, Father. Lord, it instills a great faith in us and moves us and pushes us forward to do the ministry of filling this world. Help us, Lord, to take from this what happened in the past and that we may use it for their glory in, the, in our times. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless the pastor, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what the Lord awfully to teach us. Whatever we have heard today, every one of us, Lord, may take it to our heart and it may work in us for thy glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Mr. Manohar. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful week ahead. God bless you all. Thank you, Pastor. Yes.